You know, a lot of movies are based on the premise of someone being wrongfully accused or convicted of a crime. Like the fugitive, this man is running from the law, he's trying to stay out of jail, trying to establish his own innocence, and at the same time trying to figure out who really did the crime. And imagine he's knowing that at any moment he could be apprehended, constantly looking over his shoulder, always watching people to see who's watching him, living in fear whenever he sees a police car drive by, fearing that one day he'll have to stand before a judge and hear the gavel drop with a loud bang and the judge declares him guilty. Now I'm sure you've been in a courtroom, maybe if not in person, at least in the movies or on TV. And in the courtroom, the judge sits in this elevated platform high above everybody else in the room to indicate his or her authority and prestige because the judge has a power to make decisions that will change people's lives for decades and even generations. It's an intimidating image. But what if you actually are standing before the judge and you actually are guilty and the penalty for your crime is death? What a fearful prospect that would be. But you know, in a very real sense, that's where we're all standing. That's our predicament. Because the Bible pictures God as a judge, and it envisions us as standing before Him in the court of heaven, charged with violating God's law. The problem is, we're actually guilty. We have broken God's law. And the judge of the universe is about to bring down the gavel to sentence us to eternal jail or even execution, and He's perfectly just and right to do so. Imagine the sorrow, the guilt, the feeling of failure, the terror of facing that ultimate sentence. What hope do we have to escape his punishment? Is there a way that we can be released from this sobering fate? In this series, we've been talking about the atonement. And the atonement refers to the work that Jesus did when he died on the cross. It means that we're reconciled and that we come into a harmonious relationship with God. And whatever separates us from him is removed. Well, the thing that separates us from God is our sin. And God, as a just judge, cannot just look the other way. He has to uphold the law. So in this series, we've seen that when Jesus died on the cross, He set us free from the slavery of sin, that He's the ultimate provision for our sin. And now today, in our final message of the series, we're going to also see that Jesus was executed as a criminal in our place to fulfill the demands of justice so that we could be acquitted and thus come freely into a relationship with God. So pick up your Bibles. Let's take a look at this final image of the atonement. We're calling it the cross and the courtroom. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in a court a number of times. Once I served on a jury, that was interesting. Once I was actually a witness, I got sworn in. I sat up in the witness stand and and I told what I know. Many times I've been in the gallery as somebody's pastor or as a supportive friend. And twice I stood before a judge with my wife by my side and the judge declared that our adoption was legal. I've only been in the court once as a defendant. That was in traffic court. I went to contest a ticket. And even that was pretty intimidating because there's the judge still sitting in his robes and there's an officer in uniform with his sidearm uh, carrying on his side. And I didn't know the rules. I didn't know the protocol. And I thought, man, I can't imagine what it must really feel like to stand in court facing serious criminal charges. What would that be like? And yet before God, that's exactly our position. We've all sinned. And as a result, our sin makes us guilty as charged. Now to begin with, none of us is exempt from sin. Do you remember that definition of sin that we've been using? Sin is going our own way instead of God's. It's trusting and acting in our own opinions and our own feelings rather than trusting and acting on God's truth. Now we've all done that. We all continue to do that. The problem is, the Bible says every time that we go our own way instead of God's way, that we're actually breaking God's law. It says it in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. So you can think of the Ten Commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, don't covet, don't lie, don't commit adultery, honor your parents, you know, don't put anything as an idol above God, all the rest of that. He says, whenever you do that, you're breaking God's law. Now Jesus took all of that and he summed it up into just two broad strokes. He said, first, love God with your whole heart, love your neighbor as yourself. And everything that you and I do that doesn't then reflect love and honor toward God above everything else is breaking God's law. 
and everything you and I do that doesn't put others first, we're breaking God's law. And then Jesus went even one step further to point out that God's law doesn't just cover our outward actions, but it extends to our thoughts and our motives and our attitudes. And he said that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, You've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. So God's law sets a much higher standard than human laws because human courts don't have the ability to discern inner attitudes and motives, but God does. And so we're held accountable for anger that reflects the spirit of murder just as much as murder itself. Jesus says that's enough to bring you before the court of God. And so, listen, it's not just that we've made mistakes. It's not just that we failed to be our best selves. We've broken God's law. And breaking the law then makes us guilty as criminals. We see this in Romans chapter 3. It talks about God's law in verse 19. Obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given for the purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. So it says that God's law, this God that governs the universe morally, is not given to provide a ladder for us to climb to God or to prove ourselves worthy. The Ten Commandments were not handed down as a way for us to establish a good record for ourselves before God in His court. Verse 20 says, No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Its purpose instead, it says, is to keep people from having an excuse to demonstrate that everybody is guilty before God without exception. And so it summarizes in verse 20, the law shows us how sinful we are. So the fact is that just like the rest of the world, each one of us is guilty as charged. And You've got a criminal record before God, and so do I. And we've all been arrested and we're waiting trial and there's no question what the verdict will be. God is sitting in his heavenly courtroom ready to drop the gavel and to pronounce sentence on us. We should find that sobering. What hope do we have? Well, here's our hope. The Bible tells us that Jesus was convicted in our place on the cross. See, for God to be a just judge, somebody has to be convicted and punished for every crime. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened is that he was sentenced, he was executed as a criminal in our place. We did the crime, he did the time for us. Now you might be thinking that that really can't actually happen, that for for justice to be done, the person who commits the crime is the one who has to pay. But I've seen reports of cases where it did happen in the legal system, a case in Chicago not long ago, for example, where a judge allowed one person to step in and fulfill the sentence for somebody else. So let's think about how that works in God's courtroom, in this image, this scenario. Imagine, if you want to use your mind's eye, imagine that you're standing in court, you're staring up at this judge elevated above you, and the judge is Almighty God. And he's about to pronounce sentence, and as he does, Jesus steps up. And he says, hold on, I'll take the punishment. Whatever sentence that he deserves for breaking your law, I'm going to fulfill the sentence for him so that he can go free. Jesus says here, why I'm doing that is because I love this guy. Even though his crimes are great, even though he deserves whatever he gets, it pains me to think of him suffering that penalty. It pains me to think of us separated in our relationship forever. So I'm going to meet the demands of justice so he can go free. And the judge says, you know what? I love him too. So I'm going to accept your offer. But did you realize that his crime deserves death? Are you willing to step in even on those terms? And Jesus says, yes, that's how much I love him. I will even die on his behalf. And here's how the Bible describes that in Romans chapter 5. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Now, I want you to understand that this whole scenario of Jesus dying in our place to pay for our sin, that this whole thing is only possible 
because Jesus is both human and divine. He's fully human. He's also fully God. And that's how He can make this atonement for us and how that can work. So let me explain what I mean. First of all, on the human side, because Jesus was human, He could actually represent us in God's courtroom. He could fully identify with us before God and stand in our place for us because He was one of us. You're probably familiar with the idea of a class action lawsuit. That's where a group of people file the lawsuit together. They all have the same claim. They all have the same experience or injury in common. But to be part of the class action lawsuit, you have to be a member of the injured class. So I can't join a lawsuit for damages against big tobacco because I've never smoked. I'm not part of that class. Well, Jesus could represent human beings in God's court, in the heavenly court, and He could take the punishment for us because as a human being, He is one of us. Now secondly, again, thinking about His humanity, because He became human, He could actually die. You see, we've seen in recent weeks that death is necessary to make atonement for sin. Hebrews chapter 2 puts it like this. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood, for only as a human being could He die. So you see, unless Jesus was truly human, truly mortal, unless He became flesh and blood, He could not pay the penalty for our crimes because He had to actually die. So that's the first part of the equation. Because Jesus was fully human, he could represent us as one of us in God's court, and he could actually fulfill the death sentence for us. But it wouldn't work without the second part of the equation as well, the deity of Jesus. We would still be condemned for breaking God's law if Jesus was not also fully God himself. First of all, a couple elements of that. First of all, that means he had no record of his own. Jesus never sinned. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, says that he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So Jesus never broke God's law himself, not in action or word or attitude or motive or thought. So there were never any charges against him. And without his own punishment to bear, he was able to then to bear our punishment for us in our place. Now the second part of the deity equation is that only because Jesus was God could he make a sacrifice that was great enough to cover the sins of the whole world. Let's explore that for a minute. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2 verses 13 and 14. At the end of verse 13 we pick it up there. It says, for God forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Now, he mentions this record of charges against us. And in the justice system, you see every time that you've committed a crime, every time that you've been arrested, that creates a record. Now, in God's court, as we've seen, that record for each one of us is very long. And then it said that God took that record. He forgave those crimes. He canceled that record. And how did he do that? Verse 14, by nailing it to the cross. Now that's a word picture. Obviously, a bunch of, of documents aren't, weren't literally nailed to the wood there on, on Mount Calvary. Of course, Jesus was literally nailed to the cross, but in the writer's imagination, it's as if, he, it's as if God took your criminal record and of all the sins against Him and against His law, and when the nails went into Jesus' flesh that secured Him to that instrument of death, those same nails secured your record there with Him. And so what that word picture is saying to us is that the charges against you for your crimes were assigned to Jesus, and He paid for them when He died on the cross. In effect, that warrant that was issued against you and I was rendered null and void on the cross. And in your small group this week, I want to encourage you to talk about what the analogous action would be in a modern court of law that would reflect that same concept, that same result. What would be a contemporary word picture that would convey that same message? But think about this now. If the charges against you were assigned to Jesus on the cross, okay, that's a heavy thing to bear. But then what if you add the charges against me also assigned to him there? That doubles or maybe triples the weight. But now you extend that to take the charges of God's law against every single person in the room today. And you extend that on and on to encompass now the whole world and then extend it back in time throughout all the centuries and all of that's piled upon Jesus at the cross. How was he able to have the charges of millions of criminals assigned to him? 
And how is he able to bear the penalty for all those sins, for all those countless people? It's only because Jesus was fully God himself, that he could bear the full effect of God's punishment versus sin. See, we're talking about a massive dose of condemnation and guilt, the sins of crimes of millions of people laid upon him. No mere mortal man could bear the weight of all that without being annihilated. And so God nullified our charges by assigning them to Jesus on the cross, and he could only do that because Jesus had no charges of his own to answer for, and because he had an infinite capacity to bear our sin. That's because Jesus was God. Now let's think about what that atonement means, what that sacrifice that he made for us, what does that mean for us in our daily lives every day? It means that we can live in righteousness. First, it means we have a clean record now in God's sight. The record of our our sins has been expunged. But more than that, our record is not now just neutral, it's not just blank, but we've been given a positive record in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Literally, that's saying that as our sin was assigned to Jesus, as we've seen, our record became clean, but the other piece of it here, the second half of the verse, says that Jesus' righteousness was then assigned to us. It's like we traded our sin for His righteousness, and that gives us then something to offer to God. And one of the pastors on our team was telling me this week about a problem that he encountered with the IRS. He's preparing his taxes, and he went and called them about something, and they couldn't find any record. They said, your taxes have already been paid. And he said, wait, I haven't paid my taxes. What's going on? And he found out that on some of his records, his social security number was listed wrong. It was off by just one digit. Now, he's not sure what's going on or what's going to be the implications of all that or how that happened. But somebody else's tax payments were credited to his account because of that error. The system thought that that Social Security number belonged to my friend. And we're trying to figure out maybe that the money that he paid in taxes the last couple of years never got credited to his account and maybe it went to somebody else. Well, that was somebody's mistake, but it illustrates something that God did not by mistake but intentionally. God took the record of our sin and he assigned it to Jesus. And he took the record of Jesus' righteousness and he assigned it to us, credited it to to our account. He took all the obedience that Jesus rendered to God and all of his worthiness and he put it in our file, put it on our record. Again, not by mistake, but because he wants to be in relationship with us forever, he had to remove the thing that stood between us and him. Remember, the law says, love God with your whole heart. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I've failed to do that. And in Christ, I know I'm forgiven for my failures. But I still haven't obeyed the law in a positive way, in any kind of way that translates into any merit before God, or in any way that makes me worthy before God. And so what God did was, He chose to take the righteousness of Jesus, and all of His obedience, and all of His worthiness, as the only ever truly law-abiding citizen in the whole universe, and He took it and applied it to me. So that we can be worthy in God's sight, not by our own righteousness, not by our own worthiness, not by our own good works or religion or anything else, but simply because we're wrapped up in and we're presented to God in the righteousness and in the worthiness of Christ. What an amazing expression of God's grace this is. On one hand, we're spared from what we truly do deserve. Thank God for that. And also, on the other hand, at the same time, we're freely given what we never could deserve. This is why Christianity is such good news. This is why we celebrate Jesus Christ and why the cross is so important to us. And as amazing as that is, there's there's just one more thing. It's not just that our standing changes. It's not just that we get assigned this good record because of what Jesus did. But God now actually goes to work in us to bring about a new kind of righteousness in our lives. He begins to transform our actions, our attitudes, our thoughts. Romans chapter 1 says, There is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. That summarizes what we've already been talking about, how the judge of the universe has declared us not guilty for those who belong to Christ by virtue of our faith in Him. But I want you to now look at verse 2. He goes on to say, And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. 
And so having acquitted us of our sin, God starts a rehabilitation process. He puts his life-giving spirit within us. He begins to change us from the inside out. So we don't go back to the way that we used to be before that got us into so much trouble in the first place. We now have the capacity to live in a new way, to live in a way that honors God and that keeps His law. And now we have the new motivation and a new heart that wants to do so. Now here's a question I hear a lot and arises often. Well, if I'm forgiven of of my sins like you're talking about, What reason is there then to go live righteously? Why don't I just go live however I want to if I just know I'm going to be forgiven? But here's what you have to understand. You see that the atonement is not just about being declared not guilty. Because at that moment that God declares us not guilty, He also makes us a new person. He gives you a new identity. He puts His life-giving spirit within you, as we just said. And so you're not the same anymore. And then in response to what he's done for you, then you want to live to honor him. And I think a great illustration of that is the story of Jean Valjean in Les Miserables. I know a lot of you love the musical version. I never saw it live. I saw the film version of the musical. And I I mean, there were some high points, but I really like the film version better with Liam Neeson and Jeffrey Rush. Anyway, here's how the story goes. Valjean is released from prison where he had spent years at hard labor for stealing bread to feed his hungry child. But now he has no prospects for work or sustenance. And so as he, as he gets out of the work camp, a pastor charitably invites him for a meal and to, to have a bed for that night. And what happens in the night is that Valjean steals all of the pastor's silver. And he, and he runs out, but he's caught by the police. And he's brought back to the house to be identified. And we expect that, Valjean, that Jean Valjean will be sent back to prison for his theft. But the pastor says to the police officers, no, he never stole that. I gave him that silver. And then he tells Valjean, go and be a changed man. Take it and change. And so in response to that act of extravagant mercy, Valjean goes on to a completely new life and a completely new identity. And he becomes the benefactor of many people who he gives generos- generously and sacrificially of himself to help others. So this pastor said, I'm not holding you guilty for your theft. I'm making it a gift. I'm letting you go free. And Jean Valjean did not use that gift and go out and sin more. He didn't go out and steal more stuff. No, it moved him to a new perspective in grateful response to the gift that he received. And that's exactly how we respond to the atonement. Because we've been declared not guilty by God because of the cross, our lives then begin to change. So as we close, use your imagination to put yourself back in that courtroom again. You're guilty. The judge is about to pronounce your sentence. And a benefactor steps in and offers to do the time for your crime in your place so you can go free. But what if you say no? What if you refuse the offer? What will the judge do? Will he force it on you? What if you insist on your own innocence even though you're guilty? What if you in your pride, you insist that you don't need anybody to take the hit for you? It's very simple. If you don't say yes to the offer then you won't experience the benefits. You'll be sentenced to receive the consequences of your crime. Now, I know you know what I'm saying by that in illustration. I'm encouraging you today to say yes to what Jesus has done for you. He died for your sins. Your charges were attached to Him on the cross. His righteousness is applied to your record only only if you admit your guilt and you admit that God's judgment is correct and you say yes to the gift that Jesus offers. You can be declared not guilty even of the worst and deepest and most numerous sins and crimes that could ever be committed, but you have to turn to Jesus in your need. Put your trust to Him. Don't wait another day. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for providing the way that we could be acquitted before You because we admit we are sinners. We are criminals before you. God, we've broken your law. We see that. Thank you for giving us a hope of a way out that we can be declared not guilty even if we are because Jesus paid the price for us. God, I pray that somehow that'd get through to us, that we'd be humbled by that, that we'd acknowledge and admit how much we need that. Father, show us this hope 
bring each one of us, God, to the place where we recognize our need and our sin and, and that you're right. And where we see that what Jesus did is big enough and good enough for anything I've done. For even the deepest, darkest aspects of my past. So God, we put our hope in you today. I pray everyone would be encouraged to trust you today. Father, and may we go on having received this gift by your Holy Spirit. Come and live within us and and produce in us this new kind of life of righteousness that follows your law, that begins to look a little bit more like Jesus and the way he lived. So thank you, Father, for doing everything you've done for us. May we say yes to your gift today, we pray in Jesus' name, for his glory and honor. Amen.